It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating passage because it's organic. He's making an analogy, you know, between life, art, and, you know, an artificial animal. But then the second sentence tells you something even more dramatic. And it goes something like this. For what is life but a motion of limbs, wherein, wherein the principal part within is moving? Why not we call all engines, all autonomous, engines that move with wheels and springs as doth a watch an artificial animal. Is there a better statement of the mechanistic worldview? Is there a better statement of the mechanistic worldview? We create Leviathan, the state. I think that we have an opportunity with some circumspection, with some hard work, with some real serious discussion to overthrow this mechanistic worldview. I don't think it works. In fact, I don't think it's real. I think it's unrealistic. It doesn't match very well with what now satellite sensors tell us, remote sensing tells us, when we look at the global system, you know, as it seems, you know, it's alive. Isn't it great? It takes a Western scientist to announce the Gaia hypothesis and everyone, man, he's a genius. Man, that's a genius insight. The earth is living and we're going like, that's new to you? That's ancient in our traditions. You know, how could it be understood any other way? So here's where the hope resides. Here's where the hope resides. The hard work we've got to do now is in this cultural climate change we've got to create. And I would argue we have an opportunity now for indigenous scholars, indigenous thinkers, some of us who are scientists, some who aren't, to work with the best and brightest in scientific fields to start a very difficult discussion about how we understand these incredible, at this point even, global scale problems. Global scale problems by virtue of their very complexity and the fact that the Earth system itself is extremely diverse, extremely complex, that we can have one-size-fits-all solutions. The way you deal with something will be depend on the place you live because we're not all going to experience climate change the same way. If you're living in the British Isles, I guarantee you, you're not going to have, I mean, my gosh, even Prince Charles is on board saying, guess what, folks? Uh, global warming, British Isles are going to get much colder because of the way we're changing the ocean currents, the mixed water, the freshwater, salt water mix. Guess what? If you live in those beautiful Pacific islands, you're fishing, your aquatic ecosystems are threatened because the coral systems are dying at a rate much faster than any scientist have predicted because of the acidification. These are large-scale problems but they're problems that we have to situate, not in abstraction, not with great big models, but with working with people who've lived in places for thousands and hundreds of years, who as far as their memory goes, and their own creation stories, songs, customs tell them, made people of that place. That to me is where indigenous knowledge resides. We have a great opportunity now to start sharing that. We had a discussion, we, I was just talking before I started, and I'll close with this. Um, we had a discussion uh, at Wingspread. There's a famous house that Frank Lloyd Wright made, 
you know, in, in Wisconsin now it's a retreat center and, and Warren and I were there with a bunch of people talking. And one of the things that came out as we talked about, about the issues and what we needed to do, one of the things that, um, again, Orrin, if I misspeak, you'll correct me, but I think it was Orrin who made the comment. He said, you know, back in the day when we were first getting ready to go to the United Nations and talking about a basic call, you know, to consciousness, he said, we were told by people, and these were people high up, people like in the United Nations, UNESCO, so, said, boy, what our people really are, are afraid of is that the Indians are going to get together with the scientists. Because if they do, you guys are going to change everything. I think it's time for us to do it. I think it's time to do it. So hope. A lot of people right now, there's something kind of bubbling up. I wasn't going to let the cat out of the bag because every, all of us that are in these communities, academic communities, reservations, who are kind of looking at some of the issues we're talking, I think that, that, that one of the things that is, is we're all waiting to see is where those places are going to be emerged where we're going to start these difficult dialogues. You're so fortunate to be in the homeland of the Haudenosaunee, in the backyard of the Onondaga. I would say Syracuse University, particularly with the leadership of someone like Robin Kimmerer, could become one of those centers where you have these very difficult discussions. And they're difficult. I don't want to make anyone think these are going to be easy, okay? I think Haskell Indian Nations is a place in Lawrence, Kansas where we could start these discussions. And there are other places. It just doesn't have to be one place. But I think we've got good work ahead for us. I'm glad to see some young Native students here, young non-Native students here, young students here, elders here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, we've got hard work to do. And we're all going to have to do it together. We're going to have to proceed uh, honestly, which means sometimes people are going to say things that we're not going to like hearing. But we need to listen, we need to try to understand, and we need to try to start, you know, comparing notes. How can we improve this world that we're a part of? Now, we're not in charge. So my first point again, we've got to start paying attention to what the world around us can teach us about who we are. And if we do that, someone said, oh, so you're against progress. God, I hate these people who get up and just, oh, they're against progress. Well, I, you know, progress is such an incredibly value-laden word. I mean, you know, progress. So, I, well, I guess it kind of depends on how you define progress. If bigger is better and that's progress, I'm against it. In principle, I don't think bigger is better. If uh, it's like that bumper sticker you see on some cars, you know, he has the most toys, wins. I, I don't buy that. I don't think it's about who has the most toys, wins. That's, if, if that's what you think progress is, I'm again, okay? But let's try this. Why don't we see if we can start enacting systems of life enhancement? I didn't say human life enhancement. I said systems of life enhancement, where we're one small part but when we're calling on our relatives to help so that we can begin to live our lives with good con conduct, responsible, considerate, and leave something in those future seven generations other than a tremendous amount of pain, heartache, and problems. We don't have to do it alone. We have many relatives who can help us. I'll close with that, and I'd love to have questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. If you kind of stand up so everyone could hear you. Yeah. And leave because the hair's not in the way anymore. <laughs> <laughs> As much. There's still some hair. Uh, 
the invisibles in climate change, the, I'm going to go a little more me mechanistic okay. in a minute. That's but, fine. But the, the, the invisibles I talk about are that no one sees the gas go in the car, and no one pretty much contemplates the oxygen coming in through the coat or whatever. And no one puts their hand out the window when they're going 65 to feel what the wind is doing. <laughs> Because it's invisible, right. it's not there, right. uh, so you don't have to be concerned with aerodynamics. <laughs> you can go 74, and it doesn't yeah. make any difference versus going 60. Right. And then you don't see the exhaust coming out of the car, except for if it's winter, you see it when you're stopped. Right. Uh huh. So with all those invisibles, I think the carbon disappears. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm serious. Oh no, I, I think it's a that's a, a marvelous point. You know, that's a marvelous point. And 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 your question is, I agree with you on, on your statement. Well I think that if if you don't take into your imagination mm -hmm. what's really happening, that there is gasoline being used. Right. That you are using it. Absolutely. And that something is being made in terms of coming out the exhaust. Mm -hmm. If you overlook all that and really let it be invisible, then uh, your attention <coughs> is distracted. <laughs> well, let me. Okay, so, so here's what I think. Here's what I think you're saying, and then you can correct me. Okay, because I've misunderstood a lot of things in my life. The first point seemed to me that one of the challenges of a kind of experiential kind of learning I've talked about, these things are hard to experience in a palpable way. I mean, yeah, we know oxygen, we know CO2, we know methane, but we really don't see it or feel it. Okay, so here would be a point where I would argue, and I, I, I don't have any problems doing this, I think every child in the United States would benefit from a good atmospheric chemistry class. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's nothing in that teaching that violates indigenous knowledge systems. That's something that's real. I think we need that. I think the thing then that, that is important is the second part of what you're saying about our automobiles. And uh, I've gotten in trouble for saying this with people before, but I'm going to say it. Um, I'm not interested in pointing fingers at individuals and, and, and taking a holier-than-thou view of how we're going to deal with this. I came here in a large airplane that uses fossil fuels. Now whether this talk was worth a carbon offset, I don't know. You guys may think, no, we just got a lot more hot air. We've got to go stay home. It's, it's really a good point. It's something to think about. And I think the challenge is to make people connect those dots, to say, you know, there are cars. I mean, the thing that surprises me is the, even the improvements in internal combustion engines are such. Now, you can buy a conventional gasoline-burning engine that will get 50 miles to the gallon now. Why do you need a gigantic Hummer or Yukon SUV for one adult and one child? to be rolling around everywhere that gets, still gets 15 miles to the gallon. I mean, that's a practical issue, I think, and, and connecting those dots is really important. Oren has a comment. You raised your hand. Well, just simply that plane where it went, whether you were on it or not. So. <laughs> so I, yeah, I went all about Dan. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Our elders keep us humble. What about you, Dan? It would have gone whether you were on it or not. Can can you oh oh you can go first okay was. yes back Fine. here and then oh so uh, that made me think of how you know you go to restaurants now and it'll tell you how many calories are in your burger right yes so how about after you drive your car every time you stop your car and park it it goes 
boing, that's how much CO2 you put out. <laughs> Bingo. Right? At least you have an awareness. What's wrong with that? At that point, what you did that day. And, and you know, it's interesting because there are these little things that are going on. So the big uh, uh, utility provider in uh, eastern Kansas now is called Weststar. And they've gone very public on trying to reduce consumption and things. And so um, they're, they're, you know, put in now what they call smart meters. How, how many have a home with a smart meter in it? In Lawrence, Kansas, they have put in meters that have the computer chips in it so you can get online and you can download data hourly about what you're doing in your house. And now, I just got something in the mail the other day that says, we will put in a smart thermostat for you. And you can set it so that whether you're there or not, it will make these shifts in on and off temperatures. And I'm going like, that's pretty good technology. The problem and I'm glad I, I don't have it with, with this audience. I, 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 I can see it. You guys get it. Sometimes people think I'm, I'm anti-technology. I'm not. See, I've said, let's reevaluate technology. Communication, culture, you know, community. Community includes that e ecosystem we're a part of. Those are our community members. And if we just reframe things that way, we could come up with a whole new set of metrics about what was profitable. Not in the bottom line in an economic calculation, but in a bottom line in terms of a life system enhancement measure. There are things we can't measure. I'm not, and, and I don't want to leave anyone with the misrepresenting the fact, um, and, and I'll just say it. I'm not going to share any tribal secrets. I'm not going to do do anything I have no right to do, but there are parts of our knowledge systems that step way outside the bounds of what Western science would accept. I come from a tr tradition, quite frankly, some of you in this room may come from similar traditions where prayers have efficacy, they have consequence, and things we do ceremonial, ceremonially have consequence, have efficacy. Now, scientists may have a difficult time with that, and we don't, that's not something we, we're interested in sharing. But I think that, that, again, you know, there's a lot that we can share and talk about. And so the, we really have an incredible opportunity to start that conversation. Now, that's my optimism, and my wife always says, oh, the problem, you're an educator, Dan, you, you have to be optimistic. And I, I thought about that a lot, and I said, well, I don't have to be optimistic, but I guess if you are an educator and you really believe what you're doing is important, you better be an optimist. I don't want a pessimist teaching my child. So I guess I'm guilty. <laughs> but I'm not unromantic, I don't think, and I'm not unrealistic. I think I'm talking about some practical insights we need to figure out how to apply in the world we live in right now, right here at Syracuse University. So I've got students now. I'll tell you what's going on at Haskell Indian Nations University right now. Some of you I know in this room are aware of this. Haskell has been, has stopped a major trafficway freeway development through the Wakarusa wetlands now for 20, well, it's really been about 23 years we've been in the fight. We lost the last round in the federal court, but the fight's not over. We need allies. We need people who are like-minded and want to join us in, in fights. And so here's the good news. Here's the good news. Last night, the Haskell Wetlands Preservation Organization that started in 1992 when the county first rolled out their plans, we're going to build this traffic way across the southern edge of your campus and through one of the last major contiguous riparian wetland ecosystems in northeast Kansas. And we said, no, you're not. And we've been fighting it ever since. The Haskell Wetlands Preservation Organization just 
sent a letter to the Chancellor of Kansas University asking for 20 acres of wetlands in that body that were transferred to the university over 40 years ago, have asked the Chancellor if she would return that to the students of Haskell Indian Nations University. And last night they went to the Kansas University Student Senate. Population of Kansas University, now main campus, is about 22,000. And I got a text message last night and Cleta said, we not only won the vote, said the KU Student Senate voted 98% in favor of supporting the Haskell students' request to the Chancellor for her to return wetlands acreage to the students of Haskell Indian Nations University. We've got plans. We've got plans. So that's that's what that that's that's what I'm looking for. And and people will say, well, how come you're always going over here, or going over there? We need outlines. I don't have to tell. Uh, if you will, my Onondaga relatives, this, you've got, uh, we know, given the kind of artificial political boundaries that have been imposed on our nations, we could build the best environmental policy in the world. Prairie Band Potawatomi, Citizen Band Potawatomi. We could build the best air quality standards, the best water quality standards, the best, you know, uh, bioremediation projects with current <laughs> contamination we have. But you know what? We could do our very best. And what our neighbors do that live upwind from us can destroy it all. We need allies. We need partners. Let's figure out how we can use great places, uh, 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 you know, like the Institute. Robin, you, you've got a new center, the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. That ought to be a place where we bring the best and brightest together. And uh, we have a group I've been working with for about seven, past seven years, the American Indian Alaska Native Climate Change Working Group. I convene it twice a year. It was started with NSF money. We've continued on now with a lot of support from different federal agencies. One of the most important agencies that has supported us has been NASA. Um, we are going to have a meeting. We've, we've tried to move meetings around. We've met at the Lummi College on, on uh, um, Bellingham Bay on their reserve. We've met at Salish Kootenai College in the Northern Rockies. We've met at Menominee College. We just had our most recent meeting in the desert at Tahano Autumn College down in the Sonoran Desert. And uh, it looks like right now uh, we will be convening our fall 2013 meeting at Dartmouth, Univer Dartmouth College. I'm so excited about that because I'm hoping that all of our Haudenosaunee relatives, this will be fairly close. You know, you don't have to get to Billings, Montana to come to this meeting. Maybe uh, I'm hoping that our, our, our Micmac, our Passamaquoddy, our Penobscot, the, all of our relatives here from the Mid-Atlantic coast through New England will come to this meeting. It'll be the middle of, of October. So keep posted, Google American Indian Alaska Native Climate Change Working Group. We'll try to put it on our Facebook page when that meeting is. Or just call Robin because uh, I'm hoping they'll be to see some of you at that meeting when we convene at Dartmouth uh, College in October of this year. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you mentioned indigenous realism. Yes. And you said that there were like three facets of it. Mm -hmm. Can you just go over those one more time? I'm okay, so, and, and again, this is just, it's, it's just a word, but it's the way I've tried. People like to have something to hang something on. So indigenous realism, the first principle, and, and I mean, it's non-negotiable, it begins with spirit. So that makes some people say, you know, well, that's not really realist, realistic. And uh, although I would remind people in the Western tradition, uh, uh, Plato is often identified as the first real, philosophical realist, and he begins with spirit, the forms. There is a tradition of that in, in, in the oldest parts of the Western tradition. We begin with spirit, we begin with experience, and then we begin with this ecological sense of community and the notion that we find out who we are by paying attention to what the non-human relatives of this planet 
can teach us about being human beings. That I would call, for me, that I, that's indigenous realism. I don't think it's romantic. I think it's realism. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I, I have two comments, actually. The first one is that I fully understand the need for an intersection mm -hmm. between the culture and the various issues that we're dealing with. And I think that beyond climate change, it's something that we just need for conservation in oh, general. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because, and I've kind of shifted my focus a little bit through okay. the course of being here at ESF because I've come to find that the ultimate effort for any conservation plan is actually um, informing the public that live within those systems about mm -hmm. um, what sh needs to be done in order to restore them, I guess. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate thing that you could do is teach the public to not destroy them to begin with. Mm -hmm. Which, if we could potentially do that, and I find that a lot of the indigenous people that I've talked to, they have a firm handle on that. Mm -hmm. And I also find that the social um, aspect that we're dealing with now right. and the changes that are coming about are a benefit for that. And I feel that the greatest um, opportunity that we have is with the young because absolutely because I'm not saying the older generation are stuck in their way or stuck in their ways or now be careful why are you <laughs> looking at me when you say that I'm not, I'm not saying longer, they're incapable yeah. of changing their mind <laughs> um, but I feel like if um, we teach our children and our children's children in a different way mm -hmm. then um, it's of great benefit to the society as a whole. And I, and I say that because I'm here because my mother had a slightly different perspective. Yeah. And so she taught me in a slightly different way and, I, and it's changed the whole perspective that I've lived my life. Um, but I, I understand what you're saying with the unfortunate aspect of being disconnected as well with new social mm -hmm. media and stuff like that. So it would be an interesting aspect to reestablish the connection to the environment for the young mm -hmm. and to teach them the value of it while at the same time to pull them away from this disconnection that they have mm -hmm. with social medias, which is, I find, to be a very big issue just with the young, the um, children that I've dealt with spend most of their time inside. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. something that definitely needs yeah. improvement. They're, they're not stupid. They are literally in a state of insulated ignorance. They, how can you know if you're always enclosed? Well, they're along those same along those same lines with the the being um, isolated through the yeah. t the cell phone or the computer or whatever mm -hmm. that is. A lot of that also happens, and I was thought I thought of this when you told the story about how the students would you know would say that well I don't need to know anything because right. it's right here in my phone right. and that's a disconnect in and of itself mm -hmm. kind of like the gasoline where well who found that information it's not like the internet goes out and does the research mm -hmm. there's a human being who did the research mm -hmm. behind it which got you the information on what was it that you said the population of Norway during 1927 yeah. or whatever it was so you know like somebody did that and if they if they had a concept of that even somebody has to keep doing it might as well be them you know they anyway, have to carry on I'm sorry well I just wanted to kind of open up a controversial controversial point okay. that it kind of circles well, around let's do it. Um, <laughs> let's do it let's do it thank you <laughs> um the system that we have currently uh, as a society is the connection that we have with our environment and everything like that, and the fact that we're basically slowly dismantling it. Well, obviously the, there's a massive disconnect, but the reason that so many efforts aren't put into place to correct it is because in order to do that, we basically have to dismantle a system that's been established by humanity for a very long time. Yeah. So, that's the point that I wanted to point to bring up. I mean, how do we make that, how do we come to the cross crossroads where society is willing to accept the 
the fallout of dismantling a system in order to correct the this problems that we've created. I'll give you the short answer, which is I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. What, what I, what I, I do know, and um, again, here's where maybe I've been looking at Leviathan too long, but I have decided that, you know, it really isn't wrong to tell young students, you know, remember, you are in the belly of the beast. You are in the belly of the beast, and there, there are several. You are so right about the institutions that we move in, educational institutions, economic institutions, dare I say religious institutions. Um, uh, these have incredible investment and power in them. And for you to think you're going to walk and say, hey, I got an idea, let's just all change this, you know, now. Uh, no. This is, this is the difficult work. Now, my, my suggestion is, young lady, you find a person in the School of Business, you find another ecologist or forest, forest person, maybe you find a moss person. We've got some moss specialists here, too. I found that one. You found her already, <laughs> okay. And, and um, you should be thinking about something that would be really useful and benefit to a community that you could do and that there are people who are actually looking for ways to do things. I'll give you an example here in just a second, a very quick example. And um, you ought to have, when you leave graduate, they do it at, you always read these stories about Harvard Business School, you know, how, how Facebook started, these three students got together and started their startup. Well, I don't know about Harvard, but I think all over the country we ought to have young people who are coming together and said, you know, we got a pretty neat idea and we're going to form a business and start doing it. And you might be surprised the response. So, there's a young man in Kansas. His name's Tony Kresnick. He's 32 years old. And he will tell you, I'm a developer. Now, I have a prejudice against developers. Generally, I, I will tell you, when a person tells me they're a developer, I want to figure out how to remove them from, you know, <laughs> where I live as soon as possible. Um, but, I, but here's a positive example. He came to Lawrence, Kansas, and we had, I bet, like Syracuse has. Maybe they've upscaled it. I hope they haven't gentrified it, but these happen often. You have places all over the Midwest where we used to have fairly active manufacturing and railroad yards, and they're abandoned now because the manufacturing jobs aren't there and the railroads don't run anymore, really. And he found this neighborhood and it had these great old manufacturing things and he said, gee, that would make a great building for condos. He said, and I'm looking at all these old warehouses. He says, you know, gee, the only real grocery store on this side of town, by the way, it's the poorest side of, of Lawrence, Kansas. I'm not telling any secrets. This is where Poor folk in Lawrence live, lower socioeconomic income. They're in service industries primarily. They're not in manufacturing jobs because we don't have those anymore. And he saw this area that has been, has gone to seed for ever since I moved there in 1974. And he had a vision and he had another man in Lawrence. He said, I'm interested in kind of, I would like to make that old warehouse a condo I think the roof space is large enough we could put a whole array of solar panels up there. He says, and all those warehouses that are along the side of the street, across the alley, why don't we have a market? Why don't we have some retail stuff? And so this young man, 32 years old, started working on a plan, went to the government, and he says, I'd like to build some condos there. And they said, well, you know, we have a need for low-income housing. He says, okay, let me work it out for you. I promise you that I'll have of the 44 units I'm going to make, I'm pulling these numbers out from memory, they may not be exact, but I will commit 32 of those to being rent subsidized, Section 8, handicap accessible spaces. Now he didn't do this on his own. He went to the East Lawrence Neighborhood Association, people who this is their home, this is where they live, they know most people in Lawrence never come there. 
because it's not where the new shopping mall is and it's not where, you know, the new stores are. And, uh, but he went to them and he said, would you be interested in this? And he worked with them. That same neighborhood association, by the way, fought tooth and nail against Marriott coming in and building a hotel and convention facility because Marriott never came to visit with them. Tony Kresnick went and started talking to the community. He got their buy-in, and within 18 months, he opened the doors. They had the groundbreaking last April. I had met Tony and heard, been hearing his name. I, so I got to go meet this young man. So I, you know, we've become friends. So said, show me what you're doing over there. And I found this young man with incredible passion, incredible vision. He kept saying to me, you know, Dan, he says, the weird part I've, I've discovered is, how come no one ever saw this before? How come... It, he said, when I came to town and I saw that, I thought, man, it's a no-brainer. This is what we should do. And um, so there's a footnote to the problem. They announced, um, the first day they announced the apartments were open for rent, both the subsidized and the unsubsidized, one-bedroom, two-bedroom uh, apartments. They were sold out within 12 hours and he now has a waiting list of 52 people and families who say when he builds the next set of solar fueled condos they want in. He's doing something people want and it's really good and I think he's gonna make some money but if he uses that money to go to another town where we've got a blighted area like that and create something and work with the community, I'd say he's not doing development. I think he's creating a system of life enhancement. You got hard work ahead of you, young lady. I don't want to tell you. Yeah, is it problematic? Is it difficult? Find some friends and allies. And when you open your business, send me an email or something. And depending on what you do, or maybe I'll order something. <laughs> okay, folks, uh, I've gone on here and you've been patient. Uh, I do have some books in the back. Um, the only thing I've been told, you know, if I do sign it when you take it to half price books, you know, to kind of sell it back, it won't be worth as much. So, But I'll be glad to sign it otherwise, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.